Check, one, two, check. Good morning, everyone. I will ask for the land treaty acknowledgement and moment of silence by Deputy Mayor Schreier. We would like to respectfully acknowledge that Quispansis exists on the traditional territory of the Woldestikwik, Malisee, Mi'kmaq people whose ancestors along the Passamaquoddy tribe signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. We would like to take a moment to pay respect to the elders, past and present, and descendants of this traditional territory. And may we remind ourselves of the important work we have before us tonight. May we t make good decisions without prejudice or bias and always in the best interest of our community, which we are here to serve. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Schreier. I would like to ask for a motion to resolve into Committee of the Whole, just to make it a little less formal. Moved by, Moved by Deputy Mayor Schreier, seconded by Noah Donovan. On the question, please vote now. Motion carried unanimously. Item number two brings us to the opening of our budget discussions. Proposed 2022 Town of Quispamsis budget. The town treasurer is going to provide an overview of the budget package and changes since October 6 of 2021. Uh, by the Finance Committee, and uh, index and budget are attached to your council packages. Good morning, Ms. Brandon. Does it just come in? Okay. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to go through the changes at the end of the presentation. Right now, I'm just going to start just a quick overview of the um, proposed budget document that you all have in front of you, just because I do know that it is new for some of you. So the first page is just an index that should give you some guidance to help navigate your way through the package. Um, so the, uh, the first page is our uh, summer, summary source of changes document which then just details out all of the changes between our external services, our internal services, and all of our various budget line items. The next part of the package is our proposed 2022 fee increases for our community services department. The next section, so pages five through 14, and they, they look like this, just uh, this part here. So what these are, are these are our summary by department um, packages. And there's a lot of numbers in front of you and we do take a lot of time to go through everything. But um, on the page with the QPlex um, information, there was a couple of percentages that were wrong on there. No numbers have changed at all, just the, the uh, percentages weren't calculating properly from the spreadsheet, but none of the numbers actually changed. The 2022 budget for Qplex ICE, for example, is still the $772,725. Just the percentage that was there was showing 65.2%. That's incorrect. It's actually only 3.3% change. So just wanted to highlight that. Uh, that would be page 12, yes. So the first line item has a percentage change of 65.2%. It's actually only 3.3%. 
It's the summary page with the cuplex. The cuplex. So just the percentage change. So it says 65.2% on the cuplex ice. It should be 3.3%. And again, no numbers changed within the budget, just the percentage change that was showing. I don't seem to have it. The next um, part of the package is the detail by line item. And this is kind of a blue section within your budget. And these are all of our detailed line items. And really, this is what we use to, um, we use this document to upload and um, prepare our document for the budget for the province. So we kind of use that. And it's, you want me to take my mask off? I can take my mask off. Um, so that's about 10 pages there. And then the next piece of the document is our five-year capital plan. So we have our five years from starting at 2022, going through until 2026. It shows all of our capital expenditures and what we're anticipating our funding to be. So page 31 then would be just the summary page of our civic relations section, which we, um, council did approve at the October 19th meeting. This is just there for your reference. Then page 32 is our 2022 proposed utility operating fund. So everything else before this section was all our general fund. Now our utility operating fund starts on page 32. Shows a summary of all of the... In the right hand, in the top corner? Yeah. No, sorry. The, the eScribe also does a um, numbering piece. So we do a separate one that is in alignment with the index. Sorry. I So page 32 then should be our utility um, operating budget summary. Page 33 is our summary of our proposed 2022 utility rate increases. Page 34 is the summary of departments for utility. We have a lot less departments within utility, so it all fits on one page, where in the general it's on 11 pages. Uh, next, we also have then our um, detail by line item page for utility. Again, this is in alignment with how we um, then prepare and submit our approved budget once it's approved to the province. And then the last part of your um, 2022 proposed budget document is the five-year utility capital fund. So again, going from year 2022 through to year 2026. So that should take us to the end of page 42 up at the top. So again, I just wanted to just go through that kind of quickly for you just so that you kind of um, could understand and see the full budget package in front of you. The presentation will be the story behind that, but this is your actual budget document. Thank you, Ms. Brandon. Acting CAO, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you for your overview to come. Good morning. Thank you, Your Worship, Council, members of staff who are here today. Thank you very much for being here. It's an exciting day when we get to look toward the future and reflect a little bit on the past. Uh, 2022 is uh, shaping up to be an exciting year in Quispam Sis, as 2021 was as well. Um, first thing I wanted to show you this morning is something that I think everyone is familiar with, and that is our town vision. 
And it says, Chris Pam Sis is a forward-thinking community where families enjoy a safe, friendly, and active lifestyle surrounded by a beautiful, natural environment. And I don't think there's anyone who would disagree with that vision and the items that are contained therein, that all of those things are certainly very true. And it's interesting when you talk about Chris Pam Sis and the Director of Community Services and I have an opportunity to travel around the country in search of sport tourism events. And we've obviously had some success with the TELUS Cup and the World Under 17 Hockey Challenge that have been hosted in Chris Pam Sis over the last five years. And um, the tagline for Chris Pam Sis is that there is no other. It's true. There are myriad Portlands and Springfields in the United States, especially it was a, a running gag on The Simpsons for the better part of 25 years as to which Springfield did they live in. But I can tell you if Bart and Homer and the gang ever come to Quis Pam Sis, they're coming here because we truly are the only Quis Pam Sis in all of the world. So that is something I think to take great pride in and I'm, I know that the residents do and I'm sure that council and staff do as well. We can't do anything without talking about COVID as much as we'd rather not. It continues to be a major influencer, disruptor in our daily lives as individuals, as residents, New Brunswickers, Canadians, and members of the human race, and it certainly has an impact in our town. Everything that we've been doing in this community since the middle of March 2020 has been with COVID in mind. There's no two ways around it. We comply with the mandatory order. We look after all of the uh, directives and guidelines that are issued by public health. It's tough. It's tough on everybody. It's tough on people as individuals. It's tough on our staff. Um, a lot of times the province would make announcements late on a Friday afternoon and those things would go into effect at midnight Friday night. So we had to be prepared for our facilities and venues on Saturday morning to ensure that we were in compliance. We've been nimble and we've been willing to adapt at all times. And it's really a credit to the team, the professional staff that we have here in Quiz Pam Sis, that they've been able to, to adapt. Um, I'll try not to use too many sports metaphors today, but when they're at the plate, they're getting a lot of curveballs, but we rarely strike out. And that's really a testament to them and their ability to not complain about those curveballs, but to get up there and, and take their licks and try to try to hit a single, if not a home run. So um, when you see those mandatory orders and when they change, and Perhaps on your day-to-day -day life, they may not have a, a lot of uh, impact, but they certainly do have a tremendous impact on our staff and, and they conduct themselves admirably. COVID measures in our facilities, again, because we need to ensure that we are compliant with the mandatory order at all times. Um, one of the things that we did, it was a unique and innovative approach, which is something that uh, the staff is known for was the implementation introduction of access cards and you can see somebody's hand swiping their card to gain access to the cuplex. We've had 4,700 people, not all of whom are Quis Pam Sis residents, but the majority are, who have signed up for that, provided us with their information so that we know who's in the building, when they're in the building, in case, God forbid, there is a, an outbreak at the cuplex or a positive case, we can let people know um, that you were there at this particular time when there was a, a positive case of COVID identified. Um, it's gone over extremely well. People seem to like it. They appreciate the safety of knowing that we're not exceeding you know, mandatory limits when there were limits. There aren't right now. As of today, there are no limits at the Qplex. Uh, the Vitos played a game there last night. They could have filled the place and still met the, uh, the mandatory order, assuming that everybody was fully vaccinated and wearing masks. Um, and we've had very few complaints over those cards. They seem to, uh, people seem to enjoy it. And it ensures that when we did have to, at the beginning of that, when we implemented the cards, that we were not, um, that we were adhering to our mandatory uh, order and the maximum numbers that were allowed in the cuplex at any given time, particularly on the walking track or during public skating. So obviously we are here today in our council chamber. Uh, other councils have returned to virtual meetings. We have not, obviously. Um, the rules permit it. There are no members of the public in the council chamber right now in case anyone is watching online and wondering why I'm not wearing a mask and why the members of council and staff who are here are not. That's because there is no public presence here this morning. Um, it is an open session of council. If you're watching on YouTube and decide you want to come down and see us in person, you're welcome to do that as long as you are double vaccinated and able to provide proof of that. Um, and then we would all be wearing masks at that time. But as of right now, we don't have to because again, 
The rules don't require us to do that, and as I mentioned off the top, we follow the rules. And again, picture on the right is our staff at the front uh, desk here at Town Hall, glass between them. There's glass between all members of council here as well to ensure safety for all. And again, I've really already mentioned the challenges that we faced. It's just on the screen now to reinforce it. Um, operational plans, ever-evolving mandatory order. Um, these are things that we've been willing to adapt to because we didn't have any choice, but we've, uh, we've done that admirably. Um, we now require proof of vaccination at public facilities as per the mandatory order. Um, the Director of Community Services is going to um, take you a little further in depth on that when she makes her presentation. But that's not cheap, but it's required, so we are moving forward with that. Uh, and again, for the most part, we haven't had any complaints from the public at the Qplex or the Chris Pamsis Memorial Arena. Um, when people come through, there is only one access point, and that is through the player's entrance, even if you're planning to go on the walking track. Uh, everybody is funneled through that opening, um, the lower doors, and uh, the security guard, friendly security guard, is there to ensure that everybody is wearing a mask and is double vaccinated. So those sorts of things obviously have impacted special events. We've seen in the city of St. John that they have uh, canceled their Santa Claus parade. We are planning to move forward with our parade. Um, their decision to cancel was COVID related somewhat indirectly. It wasn't because they can't do it or that large outside gatherings are prohibited at this time. They aren't, uh, but they found that they were having trouble um, getting a, a sufficient number of floats to have a half decent parade, so they decided to, to shelve it for this year for the second year in a row, but we are still uh, moving forward and quite optimistic that we will be able to have a Santa Claus parade in the Kennebecasis Valley in cooperation with our neighbors in Rossi at the end of November. Quick review of 2021. Congratulations to our members of council who are there on the screen. Um, you got here, it was a year late for <laughs> many of you or an extra year for, for half of you as well. And we appreciate um, the councillors who, who, who stuck around for that extra year. You know, there was, there was one particular councillor that uh, had announced prior to the 2020 scheduled election that uh, he wasn't planning to re-offer. He stuck around, everyone else did as well. And I know it was difficult for you too. It was, it was a heavy lift for everybody. COVID was not a fun time from um, March 2020 until the election in May. You didn't even find out the results as you normally would as well because of COVID. So uh, I know it was an anxious time for all of you. So it's a credit to you as well that um, for those who stuck around and who, for those who ran this year that uh, you were willing to come on board and be an elected official during a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> it's not easy being an elected official at the best of times and these are far from the best of times. So. Um, Congratulations and thanks to you for your willingness to, to stand up and uh, support our staff and support our residents and support your community because uh, at times, as I'm sure you've seen in the last few months, it can be a thankless job. So I'm here this morning to thank you. Our live streaming of our council meetings um, has been extremely well received, especially by our friends in the media. Uh, the fact that they're not physically with us this morning doesn't mean that they're not virtually with us. And we've seen that uh, over the last year and a half, that there were times uh, when something happened at a council meeting on Tuesday night and we heard it on the radio you know, 10 days later. So it was a little surprising at times to hear, oh, I, someone said I heard so-and-so on the radio. Really? When did I do that interview? Oh, no, it was from the council meeting a while back. So uh, it's also a good lesson for all of us to be aware of that... Um, Everything's on the internet now, and when it's on the internet, it's there forever. So these are, uh, sometimes it's easy to be a, perhaps a little less formal or a little more uh, colloquial when we're here and there's no members of the public or media physically watching us, but uh, they are definitely watching us just from a different uh, perspective than in the past. And another reminder that um, I think Council was aware of, but it's sometimes easy to forget, especially if you don't subscribe to Rogers uh, Television, our meetings are shown on Rogers, usually on Thursday afternoons, and then a couple of other times, sort of a, a sporadic scheduling uh, through the week. So if you do have Rogers and want to watch yourself on television, you can do that uh, after our Council meetings. This is really the pride and joy, I think, from a recreation 
special events excitement perspective in 2021, and that's the Means Cove Beach House. To, to quote Seinfeld, it is spectacular. It's a phenomenal facility. We had the chance to quickly drive by during our uh, bus tour uh, recently with council and staff. It's, it's fantastic. Um, our team deserves tremendous kudos um, under the leadership of the Director of Community Services and the Parks Manager and the rest of the team for, for moving forward with our project during a global pandemic. And we've doubled our capacity. Um, we've already had a number of special events, a number of weddings that have taken place there, and it's quickly booking up for future years as well. Um, it's, just, it's just an awesome place in our community. There's so much going on there. You have the beach house, you have the beach, there's a, a brand new playground that's been extremely well received, the boat launch, volleyball courts, softball courts, uh, and the mountain bike park that is being constructed uh, just across the road. So um, we've always talked about the Qplex being uh, probably the number one bumping spot in uh, Quispam Sis. And of course, the background, it's being a bumping spot is when you go there, you're bound to bump into someone that you know. And Mians Cove is certainly going to be that as well. And it's these types of amenities, I believe, that uh, that's what makes Chris Pam's just a community of choice. That's why people want to live in our community. It's because of these things. And um, thanks to council for their ongoing support on something like that. Envision St. John, the regional growth agency, it launched in January amid a great fanfare. I'm proud to represent our town and our council as a board member on the Envision board. What a, what a dedicated, um, enthusiastic group of community leaders that we have around that board table. Um, you know, as an inside director, um, I'm paid to be there. I guess this is probably a, the blunt way to put it, but there are a lot of community members who are not and they are, are so dedicated and they roll into um, the Envision head offices on the 16th floor of the Brunswick Square Tower uh, early on a Thursday morning and, and talk about our region, our city, our towns, the towns by the bay, which of course was the song that uh, you would have seen, heard um, throughout the summer months. Uh, and, and they're so excited about the prospects and what this region can be. And it's been very difficult for them. Uh, I'm a new, a new member of the board. I haven't gone through the heavy lifting that many of them have, um, but there was a lot of work that was done. We had Discover St. John, we had Economic Development Greater St. John, we had Develop St. John, and we had the city's Population Growth Secretariat. All of those four silos have been squashed and they've come together under Envision, the Regional Growth Agency. And I think the, the future is very bright for our region because of that. Um, I'm gonna throw in a little plug right now to this council to be patient. Uh, it's not gonna happen overnight, but it is going to happen, I can assure you. Um, and our CEO, Paulette Hicks, who is a proud Quispam CIS resident, was here and presented to council not that long ago. Um, and she's very confident that we're going to see the results. Um, Envision was a very prominent partner, supporter, collaborator, somewhat behind the scenes, but I can assure you they were there with the Memorial Cup bid. So that's a win for them, it's a win for all of us. Um, and the KPIs are coming soon. The board is working diligently with the staff uh, on that and they will be coming public um, in December, which is the, uh, the deadline under the prospectus that those need to be brought forward. And they will and you'll be excited when you see that. Strong residential growth in Quispam Sis. You know, if you look back to the 2016 census, we were the only community in our region that saw population growth. The other communities contracted. Uh, we're hopeful and optimistic that the other communities are going to be back um, with growth when this year's census is released, probably in the early spring or late winter of next year. That, of course, is the building up on Millennium Drive. And it was such a popular feature and looked so good and was able to bring people to our community that Ross A. Got one right beside it. Because we had to be flexible, because we had to be nimble, and because we had to be willing to adapt, um, our Santa Claus parade was canceled in 2020. So we had a drive-through selfie with Santa. Wow. Our community was very excited to get an opportunity to see Santa Claus. It was right down here in the Arts and Culture Park. We had a 1,000 vehicles show up that night. Um, 
I'm not sure the Canopy Cases Regional Police Force were thrilled because we sort of uh, shut down the Hampton Road, but it was a Wednesday night. It was winter time. It was not that big of a deal, but it just showed the, the community enthusiasm and the excitement that people have, and, and we see that during the Santa Claus Parade, and that's why we're so focused on ensuring that we can move forward as long as it's safe um, with COVID guidelines um, because our people want to come out and they want to take part in those events. Um, we had a similar selfie with the Easter Bunny in the spring as well. Numbers weren't quite as strong, but it was a Saturday afternoon of a long weekend, and, but it was still good. People were, were quite excited about that, and the folks who did come out um, really enjoyed it. And when we talk about these amenities and uh, the great recreational uh, activities that we have for our residents, well, we need good roads to get them there. And the construction of the Quispamsis Road and Hammond River Road, um, it's phenomenal. Um, I know when we did our bus tour and we went along the Hammond River Road, I heard some oohs and ahs from the back of the bus that uh, people were really enjoying that, uh, that new road. Um, and, and all of these things, you know, whether it's the selfie with Santa or the, the Halloween display that we have out here in the Arts and Culture Park right now, the, the lights, the road construction, um, these things don't just happen through osmosis. They happen because of the, the leadership with our Director of Community Services, Dana Purton Dixon, our Director of Engineering and Works, Gary Logier. Uh, they lead teams of dedicated, committed individuals. Um, they live in this community like you. Um, they want to see it thrive and continue to grow, so um, they deserve thanks, and they, they know that they have my thanks for the work that they do on behalf of our residents and our communities um, daily. Um, and certainly that Quispamsis Road and Hammond River Road, we made those roads, high traffic roads, uh, safer for all. As part of our 2021 year in review, um, a quick mention and welcome and another time to Catherine Shannon, our HR manager, who is with us here this morning. She came to us from St. John, so there's no question the city's loss was our gain. Um, everybody I talk to uh, just provides me with um, unsolicited plaudits for Catherine. So uh, everyone says she's an excellent hire and you're very lucky to have her, and I certainly would echo those sentiments. So Catherine, again, uh, we're very happy to have you as a member of our executive team, and we thank you for spending part of your Saturday with us here as well. Catherine was the most uh, high-profile staffing change this year. We do have the two new permanent positions that uh, Council is aware of that has been discussed here before, and that is our engineering technician and our fleet operations supervisor. Um, and as part of those two new permanent positions, we did eliminate the part-time admin position within the Department of Community Services at the QPlex. So budget challenges for 2022, COVID is certainly one of them. There's no way around it. Um, we are continually changing our processes to ensure that we comply with the mandatory order. It was changed again yesterday. And when will it end? That is as rhetorical as questions can ever become. Nobody knows. I certainly don't. Nobody else does. Um, but the Director of Community Services will talk but one of those more obvious uh, public facing ones, and that is the security guard that we have at the QPlex and the QMA. Um, we think it's important to have um, you know, a third party doing that, and we don't think that there would be really um, remarkable savings if we were to put our staff into that position. So Krista is now going to put up our changes for 2022 that we can talk about which is page one in your budget package. Page two on the bottom of your budget package, but page one in the top right corner of your budget package. So, spoiler alert, we are proposing a reduction in the tax rate for 2022 of 2.65 cents which would bring the tax rate down to 1.3163. 1.3163 in 2021, it is 1.3428, 1.3428. So that is a reduction of 2.65 cents, 1.97% overall. Our proposed expenditures Twenty-eight million two hundred five thousand five hundred nineteen dollars, and because we are bound by provincial law to have a balanced budget, 
our total revenue, $28,205,519. Mm -hmm. So the internal sources are something that we obviously are able to control much more easily than external sources, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later this morning, probably won't be actually until this afternoon. Our internal sources, we consider those to be general government, internal protective services, environmental health and development, transportation services, community services, debt servicing, and capital and reserves. General government, we're looking at a $286,000 increase over 2021. That includes $46,000 in salary changes, uh, council's increase under CPI, 2% cost of living and step movements for staff within the admin, clerk, accounting, HRIT and communications departments. The union increase in 2022 is 2.75% as per their collective agreement. $155,400 for one-time adjustments. Those items in the budget include $30,400 for website improvements and IT equipment. Our website is, I hate to use the word antiquated because it's not that old, but from a technological point of view, antiquated is an accurate description of our website. Um, and obviously in this day and age, people go to your website, they want to be able to find the information, which they can um, in a timely manner, but it certainly are starting to see some bugs. Uh, we saw that this week, we had someone from a different municipality reach out, uh, they couldn't find our animal control by law, and I said, it's on our website, and they said, no, it's not. They were right, we had that fixed within probably an hour, but uh, at that time, and again, it's one of those things until someone points it out to you, you don't really know um, that there were specific problems. So we did resolve that, but um, on an ongoing basis, we do, do need to make some investments in our website. Uh, $40,000 for asset management, which is a fleet study. Uh, $60,000 for our recreation master plan. We think that is vital as we move forward uh, in this community. And $25,000 in uh, extra solicitor costs as uh, our legal counsel is uh, soon to retire and we are moving um, to a new legal council. $59,500 in carry forward costs um, related through the strategic plan and town hall space study. Um, and there's an equal amount coming in as revenue from the operating reserve. So there's no impact to the 2022 budget for those costs because those had been uh, budgeted previously. $25,100 in uh, various reductions and increases, specifically $32,530 for cost of assessments property tax and $14,200 in insurance increases. Um, I'm sure everyone is getting your own personal insurance bills and you know that those are going up. But there is a $10,000 reduction in expenses for mayor and council, which was included in the um, modified remuneration bylaw uh, that was approved by the previous council just prior to the election. The changes to the staff, as I mentioned, the two new permanent positions is $137,411. Um, our debt servicing is $472,656. And happy to say that we paid off a $487,000 debenture in 2021. And our transfer to reserves is $75,452. That's decreased net transfers to the reserves, 75,452. So I know I just spat out a lot of numbers, which is not easy when you're taking them on the fly, but we're here throughout the day to answer your questions and clear any confusion or uncertainty that you may have. Our internal versus external spending increases, um, as I mentioned, um, we can generally control internal, those items that I just referenced general government and internal protective services, environmental health and development, transportation, those sorts of things. But um, there are some external spending that's a little bit more difficult. And I'll get into that a little bit later, as I mentioned, but just um, so you know, uh, external, including garbage has gone up 64% since 2015. Um, total budget is 31% increase in those years. 
and our unconditional grant revenue, which has been an area of concern for quite some time in Quispamsis. It's now called equalization. Um, Quispamsis, Rossi, and Riverview are grouped together. And I hate to flog the equine, but maybe just one gentle little kick this morning. Um, over the next two years, this year and next, Riverview's in the area of $3.4 million that they receive in equalization. And that would be 3.4 million more than Quispamsis and Rossi get combined. And for the quick math, it's zero. Um, and that model has um, resulted in exasperation for staff, residents, council, chairs of the finance committee um, for a long time. Um, but that's just the way it is. And, um, that change, Riverview actually did take a big hit this year, but they're still getting more than a million dollars more than we are. And that is my first of two presentations this morning, Your Worship. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any questions now or if we wanna just move forward with the next presenter and then we can save questions for a little bit later. That might be easier, but I'm here. And we'll answer questions over. now or later. I think the overview that you've given, uh, Mr. Kennedy, will allow each of the directors and the um, the treasurer to go down through each of their departments and uh, give us some explanations at that point. And if we need to question uh, from your point of view, we can call on you a little bit later. Thank you very much. As Mr. Kennedy said, uh, next we have Dana Purton Dixon, our Director of Community Services, and she will discuss the proposed 2022 Community Services General and Capital Budgets. Welcome to the podium, Ms. Purton Dixon. I know you've you and your team have spent a lot of time, many days, weeks, and hours uh, creating this budget so that we can move this beautiful town forward with all the hard work that you do. It's certainly reflected in all of the signature venues that we have at the Qplex, the Meenan's Cove Beach, and our arts and culture park, so I'll let you take it over. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm going to begin my presentation with a few highlights from 2021. The newly renovated Beach House, as the acting CEO has mentioned, would be one of the major highlights. That opened in June of this year. We've had 23 events so far this year, and we have another 23 already booked for next year. Obviously, COVID has had an impact on our uh, bookings. We've had some cancellations when the mandatory order and protocols changed, but we're confident that that will increase as we already have the same number of bookings for the next year so far. COVID has um, definitely impacted our operations as the acting CEO has mentioned. We definitely have a lot of challenges, which you'll see uh, throughout my presentation, but it's certainly not our focus. We just continue to do our job and provide the services that uh, residents and our council expect from us. And one of the new projects that we have this year is the beautiful mountain bike park that's located on land that was acquired as part of a utility project. It's located across from Means Cove Park. It will be opening soon. The construction is done. The signage is being prepared. The posts are on the ground, and we're hoping to open that in the next couple of weeks. For that project, we secured $40,000 in funding from the provincial government through a trail infrastructure project. So that was very helpful. And at the Qplex, we added our pool heat exchanger this spring. So as many of you know, our temperatures have been cool in our pool, averaging 72 degrees or 22 degrees Celsius. This summer, the average was 81 Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius. So we were very pleased to be able to provide the warmer water for our residents and pool users this summer. The Community Services Administration team launched a new booking software system this fall after months of training and preparation. This transition was by need, not by choice, due to the end-of-life software. And after a year off uh, due to COVID, we brought back our regular movies, music, and movement in the park. 
summer series, as well as hosted new events such as the Trail of Hearts, which was also so popular we extended it. It was supposed to be a week. We extended it a month because it was so popular. That was a lit trail that was down by the Cuplex in partnership with, uh, with the community organization, which was very helpful. And then, of course, the Easter Bunny selfie and drive through, which, again, was very popular. So we continue our dance with COVID. The global COVID-19 pandemic continues to cause massive disruptions to our operation. And in order to comply with the mandatory orders and provide a safe environment for the public, we continue to adapt to the ever-changing environment. We are working twice as hard to stay in the same place. It is important to staff to continue to provide services our resident and council expect by keeping our facilities open and bringing back all our special events. It was evident that our residents needed joy and fun back in their lives, and we were happy to be able to provide that opportunity. And I think that this picture very much speaks to that, and that was at, uh, taken at one of our events this summer at the Music in the Park. We continue to ride the COVID coaster. As the acting CEO has mentioned, we have our, our Friday afternoon bombs, we call them, and. We have to be nimble and ready to adapt because we have facilities that operate on the weekends and our customers, our residents, your users expect us to share with them the new protocols and how they impact our operations and their operations as well. So at the Qplex, we introduced a unique and new innovative access card system that allowed us to meet the requirements of the mandatory order for contact tracing. Our access card system, which our public health inspector was very impressed with, by the way, she allowed us to create free access, continue that free access to the walking track and to all our free skates. We had, as the acting CEO has mentioned, 47 access, 4,700 access cards have been created thus far. 64% of those were for Cuspam CIS residents. And we were fortunate to secure $15,000 in funding from the Canadian Tire Jumpstart Program for this initiative. This summer saw the opening of the pool after being closed in 2020 due to COVID. In order to open the pool and meet all the required COVID protocols, such as contact tracing, staff worked for months to create an online booking process using our end of life recreation booking software. However, the upside to this is that it provided us an opportunity to collect hard data for our users. So in the past, we would collect our data using our random postal code samplings so this time, for this season, and hopefully in the future, it allowed this process allowed us to, contact, to collect the hard data, which showed us that 57% of our pool users were from Quispam Sis, 21% were from St. John, 13% from Rossi, and the remaining 8% from surrounding communities. Also, in order to meet the most recent public health protocols requiring proof of vaccination, in order to visit non-essential areas such as the arenas, we've hired a security company to provide security guards at the QPlex and the QMA. The guards check the vaccination status of ICE users, referees, spectators, and everyone who enters. This costs over $5,000 per week for both arenas. The 2022 Community Services General Operating Capital Budget. So the picture on your left is the trail that crosses the berm at Means Cove Beach House. And it also connects to the trail along the water as well as the new AT connector trail at Sunny Lane. And the picture on the right is a section of the new mountain bike park. The terrain is mixed and the views are stunning. You can see the, the hill that's there, the trail loops around it, so there's mixed terrain out there. You're in the woods, you're out in the open, and uh, hopefully next year we'll be building a new trail that runs along the water. So we think that this is gonna be very much a destination in our community and for people visiting us. The 2022 operating budget. You'll see that there's a 21% increase in revenue in 2022. This may seem dramatic. However, in 21, there was a 25% reduction in overall revenue due to anti the anticipated impact of COVID on our rentals. And this has been added back this, into our revenue this year. 
as we resume normal operations and we hopefully will remain there. As recommended by the Finance Committee, there's a 3% overall facility rate increase. And at the arenas, the rentals are down 10 hours per week for the season from pre-pandemic bookings, four hours at the QMA, six hours at the QPlex. We're down 18 hours a week from 2018-2019 season, which is 8.5 at the QMA and 9.5 at the QPlex. So the decrease is from minor hockey and figure skating. For example, minor hockey is no longer booking 6 a.m. ice at the QPlex and figure skating and other users are not at the QMA until 4.15, Monday through Friday. There's also a sponsorship decrease of $43,000 due to the expiration of our sponsorships and not renewing. Obviously, COVID's played an impact there as well. And as discussed at a previous council meeting, we've proposed a new rental rate for storage for community groups that use our facilities at 50 cents a square foot. And this was added after the finance meeting, but discussed at a previous council meeting. Also new this year is a $29 per hour for-profit fee at the arenas, as well as a new daily rate at the QPlex of 126 per hour. The previous rate of $98 was well below market. There's also a new for-profit rate at the parks. Community Services General Operating. At the uh, picture on your left is the active transportation trail that's in the mountain bike park. So this will be the only trail that has quarter minus and it was built by our staff. The rest of the trails will be all natural and they will the intermediate, beginner, advanced trails. And in the middle of the picture at the Quispamsis Memorial Arena, just an example of the great job the staff do in preparing that facility for opening for the season. And then the picture on your right is from KV Prom. So we were really happy to be able to work with the organizing committees of Rossi High and KV High to offer the proms and they were canceled in 2020. And we followed all COVID protocols and we had a lot of very happy parents and graduates. It was nice to see that back in our facility again. So budget variations from the general operating. As mentioned previously, we have property tax increasing 4%. We have property insurance increasing 11%. We have a 3.5% increase to our lifeguarding contract at the QPlex. And as many will remember that this was our first season of contracting our lifeguarding services to the Canada Games Aquatic Center. The addition of a park seasonal position, which will be the first seasonal position in six years or that we've added to that complement. And we have budgeted for a recreation master plan. And we have $60,000 in general government, which was that was mentioned previously. So the last recreation master plan for the town was done in 1987. So I feel that this is, and I've tried multiple times over the year, but I think that this is the time. We really need to uh, engage the community, assess the current state of recreation, and plan for the future. Um, I think this document will be vital to our planning, and I'm hoping that um, we'll be moving that forward this year. Also, as mentioned, we have a reduction of a year-round part-time admin position on the administration team. We reduced that to a summer student, and we did a trial this year to, to try that out before it was recommended permanently in the budget process, and it worked quite well. So the administration team often referred to, it's often referred to the QPlex admin, but it's really the administration team for all our facilities. It's, they're based out of the QPlex along with the program director, but they really are the hub that's where all our facility bookings take place for the beach house, for the ball fields, um, the tennis courts, the arenas. That admin team manages that whole um, portfolio for all of our facilities. So we have some maintenance plans as we do every year in 2022. We have a new item, as I've mentioned, the mountain bike park. We have $22,000 budgeted in, in 2022. So half of that funding is for regular maintenance for porta potties and trail repairs and such. And the other half, the 9,500, is for a 750 meter trail that will run along the water. 
which I think will be a beautiful addition to that park. And I think it organically was going to happen with uh, once the riders get out there and see this beautiful location and the trails that we have to offer. The concrete floor in the QMA Zamboni room is deteriorated due to the re repeated use by the Zamboni with the studded tires. So the concrete is now spalling and has some cracks. So we will be applying a coating to make the surface smooth again before it deteriorates any further. And at the Qplex, there's a variety of operational projects that need to be completed. We will be replacing the carpet in the main lobby, the water level control for the gray water tank, testing of the scissor lift. We're gonna be adding a raffle counter, a board scrubber for the Zamboni, a duct cleaning, or we'll be cleaning the ducts for the rooftop units, uh, dressing room hallway repairs, uh, guard repairs, repairs for the parking lot. We also have two items. Uh, they were also mentioned previously, the Arts and Culture Park stage painting and the Town Hall building evaluation. Those two items were budgeted in 2021. Both are being carried forward with funding coming from the operational reserve, so there's no impact on the 2022 budget. I just wanted to mention those two items. So our capital budget, we plan to expand the pickleball course at a cost of $75,000. This capital item will see the addition of two pickleball courts. There's currently two courts that were built in 2016. And pickleball, as many of you know, is the fastest growing sport. And usually in the summer, there's a wait, the people are waiting to use the courts because they're so busy or they will head over to the tennis courts um, to play there as they wait um, for the courts to free up. I think COVID obviously has increased the popularity of this sport because you can play it safely and socialize outside without the risk of catching or spreading COVID. And it certainly is popular among the 60 to 75 year old age group. It's a fun, low impact way to exercise and stay active. And we feel that we are creating somewhat of a hub for the older adults in that area with the courts and the community garden. And then we also have the new green space with the outdoor classroom. And we anticipate that there'll be formal and informal gatherings that will take place in that, in that area. And if you haven't seen it yet, it's almost done and it looks beautiful. It's a nice addition to that area. And we secured $20,000 of funding from the provincial government for um, half of that project. The mountain bike trails, the parking area and driveway, 125,000. So construction of stage one of the mountain bike park has been completed. As I mentioned, we're waiting for signage to arrive for installation. In phase two of this project, we'll see the extension of Sycamore Drive and the creation of 20 parking spots. The park consists of 6.4 kilometers of mountain bike trail, including beginner, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And as I mentioned, there's the one kilometer of trail that the gravel trail, which is the AT trail, will connect Hammond River Road through to Leeswood and then um, through to Means Cove Park. So um, you'll see that that's, that's really gonna be a key, I think, focus area for the community from an active transportation perspective, um, connecting to Hammond River Park, but also to attract visitors and uh, our residents to, to visit our parks and trails. And then phase three it will be the addition of washrooms, permanent washrooms. The next item is the rehabilitation of the tennis courts, $245,000. So they were last resurfaced in 2012 when we added an additional court to go from three to four courts. The only new asphalt at that time was for the fourth court. So this is our second time installing the acrylic resurfacing. And we've exceeded the useful life of the second resurfacing, which is estimated to be between five and seven years. And this project will see the asphalt removed, the subsurface gravel layer repaired, new asphalt, as well as acrylic resurfacing being reinstalled. And the tennis courts are used all summer. They have tennis lessons, camps, tournaments for all ages. There's a very active tennis club that uses that facility, has been advocating for this work to be done for the last couple of years. They also hosted in 2021 in September the Tennis New Brunswick Junior Provincial Championships. It was a two-day tournament and hosted 40 individuals from across the province. Next, we have an active transportation trail connector, $24,000. 
So pictured are two AET trail connectors at Pettengill Road and Sunny Lane. The third picture is of the location of the new connector trail, which is between Grafton and Lower Queensbury, which will also then connect to the QR trail. So the budget includes the construction of the trail, the crusher dust, crusher dust signage, et cetera. So these trails improve connectivity and walkability in our communities, in our neighborhoods. They promote the safe movement of people. And we're striving to make the healthy choice the easy choice for our residents. The Hammond River Park upgrade, $384,000. So Hammond River Park was built in 1976. It has 3.4 kilometers of trails. The log cabin was removed this summer as it was at its end of life. So in this, knowing that in the spring, with that, knowing that we were gonna do that work in the spring, we engaged the community looking for feedback on what they thought about the park, areas for improvements, what they'd like to see there in the future. So we conducted an online survey. We had 119 responses. Following that, we engaged a consultant to provide us with a concept design and budget based on the survey results and the community feedback. The survey results told us that they would like access to washrooms, a small playground, picnic shelters with barbecue pits, and additional signage, all of which are incorporated into this park design. So council has approved this project as part of our Canada Community Build Fund submission so this project will be fully funded from the grant, so it was previously known as the gas tax fund. The next item is the Qplex roof reflective coating reinstatement, $150,000. So $32,000 for this project was approved in the 2021 capital budget. And this summer we posted a request for proposals for the project and pricing came in much higher from 130,000 to 150,000, or 180,000, excuse me. Therefore, the work was deferred to 2022. With the additional funding coming from the Safe Restart and PGAP Elimination Program, so there is no financial impact to the 2022 budget. The work to be completed will include washing and cleaning the roof in preparation for resealing with the roof coating. We anticipate energy savings as a result of this work as the white coat White coating will reflect the sun off the building, which is making it more energy efficient, which is why it was done initially. And the Qplex is a LEED Gold certified building, and this will align with LEED practices. This work will also include, uh, sorry, extend the longevity of the roof by 10 to 20 years, which again supports our asset management planning. Our next capital item is the replacement of, two, of a 2006 gator, $30,000. So this existing gator is 15 years old. The, equi the equipment is used daily, all year round. It's used for maintenance on our 23 kilometers of trails, as well as our parks and green space maintenance. We also groom eight kilometers of trail in the winter, which takes eight hours. And these current gate, like we have more than one gator, we have another one, and um, they're not enclosed, so that puts the staff outside and the elements for the eight hours that it takes to groom those trails. So the new gator will be enclosed with the heater. The Qplex cube parts, $15,000. The Qplex mechanical system has eight cubes for making ice and an additional two for heating hot water. With this funding, we will be purchasing a compressor, sensors, controller, and a solenoid. And the company that makes this, this equipment is no longer in business. Therefore, accessing parts can be challenging. COVID has also caused worldwide supply chain issues. So in order to prevent a potential shutdown, we're, staff are being reactive in ordering parts that are hard to get. At the Qplex, we would like to replace the wooden stairs with steel in the pool at a cost of $70,000. So the stairs to the slides require, there's two sets of slides. They required repairs and maintenance in preparation for the 2021 pool season. This included staining the stairs with a water sealant, replacing stair tread boards, and strengthening weak, weak spots to ensure that the stairs were safe for use. Staff are recommending replacing the wooden stairs with galvanized steel for longevity as a life expectancy would be 20 to 30 years. These stairs have been exposed to the elements year round for 11 years and see heavy traffic 
with well over 24,000 visitors to the pool each year. The Qplex lighting upgrade, upgrading to LED, $125,000. A lighting retrofit should reduce the power consumption for lighting by 50% and allow lighting to be reinstated instantly after a power outage. So with the current metal halide lights, it can take up to 20 minutes for the lights to power back on after there's an outage. And we expect a payback of two and a half years for this initiative by changing all the lights in the facility to LED. We will be applying to an MB Power business rebate program for this project and we anticipate a 25% credit. So where the total project cost would be $150,000, we're budgeting $125,000 to reflect that credit. And at the Quispam Sis Memorial Arena, we changed the lights over the ice surface and the bleachers this year. We switched them to LED and it reduced our energy lighting consumption by 53%. The building saw an overall reduction in energy use of 18% from April until October when we compare 2019 to 2021. At the Qplex with the concrete floor repairs in the Zamboni room, $13,000. The Qplex uh, Zamboni floor is deteriorated due to repetitive traffic from the Zamboni studded tires and in one location insulation can be seen. We also have piping underneath the concrete at this location. So once again, similar to the QMA, we'll be applying a coating and the surface will be made smooth again. And this work is required as part of our asset management program. Our goals are preserving our facilities and performing preventative maintenance that will increase the longevity of our assets and avoid much larger costs down the road due to extended deterioration. At the Qplex, we'd also like to replace the 2011 floor, floor scrubber at $12,500. It's 10 years old. It's used daily in the lobby, the Moosehead Conference Center, and at the walking track. And it's currently being repaired as it's not laying down water. And we've spent $1,500 this year so far in repairs. And at the Qplex, we'd like to replace the counters in the dressing rooms. Washrooms, staff room, and referee room are $21,000. So the counters are in a state of disrepair, as you can see by the pictures. So they're laminate covering over press board, and they're in constant contact with water. In some cases, the press board has become wet and swollen, which makes our repairs challenging. Staff have made repairs, but the long-term solution is required. The budget before you reflects replacing the counters with a solid durable product that can be repaired when damage occurs. It's durable and can meet the demand of the users. The existing hardware will be reused. Qplex pool piping replacement, $50,000. There was a leak in the Qplex pool that was first diagnosed in 2019 and temporary repairs were made at that time. Obviously, in 2020, as I've mentioned, the pool was closed due to COVID. When we opened in 2021, the pool water continued to leak. And after much exploration, another leak was found under the kiddie pool. Each season, we trucked in water at $300 per load. And when we did that, the cold water caused mechanical equipment to work harder to heat the water. And then we had to add chemicals to treat the water. So our costs went up as well to, for the energy costs and then for the chemical costs. So this project will see the piping in the tunnel, the underground tunnel that's around the pool replaced. There is piping under the pool slab, but that's going to remain as that work would be extensive and require excavation. At the Qplex Moosehead Conference Center, auto visual upgrade, $30,000. This equipment is 10 years old. And there's been problems with this system as the software is no longer supported due to its age. We had the installer in to perform repairs this year and to replace a controller, which is the picture on your right, due to failure. Fortunately, we were able to locate a refurbished controller at a reduced price, but they're not readily available. The present system does not have HDMI or Bluetooth connection. It's only available through an add-on device that we sourced at a local hardware store. 
Updating this system would allow us to better serve our customers and make the conference room more attractive to user groups, having the ability to work with present technologies. We have hosted several events there, including our own this year, where the system did not function properly, leaving us to improvise uh, at, the, at the moment. The next item is a Cuplex Greywater Booster Pump Replacement, $25,000. The Greywater system at the Cuplex supplies rainwater to the toilets, the Zamboni to flood the ice, and then the pool top up. And this equipment is at its end of life. So we'd like to be prepared ahead of time, obviously, and order that before it uh, ends its life, <laughs> before we have that equipment in place. The Quispam Sis Memorial Arena, the dressing room, and Zamboni room heaters, $15,000. The heaters are at the end of their life and they need replacement. Our request is to replace the heaters with a time-controlled thermostats that restrict access. And we anticipate energy savings due to new equipment, setting the thermostats, and controlling those temperatures, which we're not able to do now. That's it, Worship. Thank you, Ms. Burton Dixon. And you are going to field some questions now, are you? Sure. Okay. If you'd like to ask the questions um, right now, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Councillor Miller. Thank you, Your Worship. Hi, Dana. I know you're surprised. Um, actually, I'm going to give you the easy questions first, and then I'll ask you a harder one. You have a list. So just curious, for the pickle bar ball courts, we don't charge for those, do we? No, we do not. Okay, but we charge for tennis. So I'm just kind of wondering. Sure. I, it just, I just thought question. it's... Yeah, because I'm looking at everything else, and over the last few years, we've never charged for pickleball, which is fine. But we're actually putting a lot more money into pickleball, but we're charging for tennis. So it, it was just kind of a... Does anybody charge for pickleball, and and uh, why are we not charging for pickleball, but charging for tennis? Well, the reason is we have a tennis club that uses the tennis courts, and they have uh, they book times, so they have day, uh, tennis camps, um, they have adult play, what have you. So in order to make sure that those courts are available for their use they pay a fee to book those courts. Whereas tennis, uh, excuse me, pickleball is drop-in. We do know that there's an association. We have tried working with them because we know that there's um, some regular users that come and use the courts. Um, but we are, that is something we're working on right now that the, the KV Pickleball Club is um, operating there perhaps informally. Where so those times aren't booked as they would be when we work with a tennis club who run programs and have tournaments out of there. So they, they're a much more organized group and prefer to have the security of their times booked for them. So that, that information is published. People know that the tennis club has the court have those courts at a certain time, whereas the pickleball courts are drop in. I, I guess maybe not for for this upcoming year, because we're just talking about it now, but mm -hmm. in the future, if it does become as popular as tennis and people want to book their own times, because I mean, we're not charging huge fees, but it may be something to, versus somebody hogs the court for yeah. four hours, so. Certainly a direction we'd like to move in. Yeah. Uh, the next question, I'm just trying to understand, because um, I agree with everything you do, and I know we got to fix the Qplex, I know we got to keep up to date. But $70,000 for steel stairs seems a little steep versus um, for the pool. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. the wooden ones, I know wood's quite expensive, but it's dropped. But $70,000 for steel stairs, like, you know, obviously I don't build anything out of steel, but mm -hmm. it just seemed a, quite a high number. I'm just wondering why it's so high for for that. Well, well that's a, we have a quote for that. Um, obviously, we have a quote for all the work that we recommend as part of the budget process. But we have the longevity of the stairs is why we're recommending like 20 to 30 years. Um, hopefully, you and I won't be here when they need to be replaced again. But with the wooden ones, we would be looking at a much shorter uh, lifespan. As I mentioned, though they're outside in the elements all year round, and the usage is heavy. Um, we had a peak of 50,000 people using that pool one summer, our first summer open. Uh, this year we had 24,000. We'll expect with the warm water and COVID, hopefully on the decline, that our numbers will go back up again. So um, it also, there'd be less maintenance. We had a lot of work. Our 
our staff special pressure spray, excuse me, and stained those steel, or sorry, the wooden stairs, and then replaced stair, put on stair treads, replaced some stairs. So from a safety perspective, we prefer the steel. Um, my my uh, last easy question, uh, well, although they're all easy. For, um, in our last year's budget, and we, because we pulled out the LED lights just for different reasons, but we were also told, or I believe, and unless I for, forgot, is that the ice had to be out for us to put in the LED lights. And then last year with COVID, with the ice being out, we tried to see if it could happen, but we couldn't get the LED lights. Do, do the light, does the ice have to be out for us to put in the LED lights next year? I'll um, have to ask our, uh, I should have identified my two staff that I have with me this, this morning. <laughs> Managers of, uh, of our three with me this morning. Chris Lawrence, who manages the, Q, the Qplex QMA in the pool, and then Barry Brown is our Parks and Facilities yeah. Manager. And some of you may have not have met them yet, but I'll let Chris come to the podium and answer that question. Welcome, Chris. Oh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, yes, we, can, we don't have to take the ice out uh, based on our present when we had some contractors look at it. Bay Electric was one of them. And uh, no, we don't have to take the ice out. We can use a scissor lift. We may have to do some protection in certain areas of ice, like cover it up with whether plywood or what have you. Um, but we won't have to take the ice out totally to do that work. So. Perfect. Thank you. Because um, obviously a two and a half year payback makes makes a big deal of sense too. And plus it probably helps with the, the cooling of the ice too. You don't have the heat from the lights coming down. You got LED as well. So that's true. No, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my my uh, last question, I'm sorry for hogging the mic here. Um, I just have a question, and I'm, I'm, I know you're surprised in this, the, the uh, recreation master plan. And the reason I ask that is, one, I would, I'd like to know how much it costs, because I know during my tenure we've done a ball field master plan. Um, I think we did studies before that, and if I look at our recreation so far, I mean, we've got pickleball courts, we've got soccer courts, we've got Ham River Park, we've got rinks, we've got pools. Um, I don't know, I, I guess I'd like to know what the value of the, the charge of the, the recreation master plan. And um, and like I said, I, I think we're one of the best in the region as far as recreation trails and that. So w what is the the uh, the fee for the master plan? Because I couldn't see. 60,000. 60,000, yeah. And I think uh, to your point, um, and thank you for that, because I, I feel that that was compliment. And I think we do to council and to staff for having the vision to um, Add these amenities to our community, which makes it a community choice, and why people live in our live in our lovely town. So, what um, we would like a recreation master plan to help guide us in our work, and also to help with council. We think it would be an opportunity to engage the community to assess our current state of recreation and to plan for the future. And it's not always about building and new facilities or what have you. And it's it's also about. Um, what programs you want to see or events or maybe there's you decommission a playground in a certain area because it's not being used or repurpose that um, i think for our department we have done very well over the last several years of engaging our community uh, at, in different projects whether it's hammond river park we've done a trails a trails survey um, we have done a facility study as you know which you mentioned for uh, recreation fields in particular, we did a field study analysis, which is how we got the lights at Means Cove. So we did the analysis of our, with our user groups of their needs and their trends. And you know, we currently collect all the data from their user groups, their registration numbers, so we, and we watch that. But uh, we found out after that study that um, the lights would help to eliminate. So we rejiggled re -jiggle the schedule with the adults and the youth, and we put the lights in. And from what we've heard, we feel that the demand is being met right now. And there's obviously some COVID impacts there, I think, with registrations and, and such. But um, Ross A is also open to field. So, uh, you know, things change over the years. And it's good to, it's good to have um, a master plan, again, to assist us in our planning for the future and council as well. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Miller. And, you know, it goes along with the old adage that if we plan our work, we can work our plan. But if we piecemeal and do a baseball uh, field plan and a, a, an ice rink plan and so forth, they're not gelling together. But by having this umbrella 
to do a recreational master plan, then we can look at everything and we have uh, a better vision. So uh, certainly uh, better to be visionary. Well, I think to your comment, Your Worship, I would agree. And then also is residents will be aware of what that plan is. So sometimes, for example, I, I got a request for a basketball court this summer and we have we don't have a full size court. We have several smaller courts. Um, but then, and, and my, we, we, just, we don't have a plan for that. That's not in our vision. We haven't heard that request. So it's nice to know, is there more than one person looking for that amenity? Where should that amenity be located? Where Rossi has basketball courts, do we need to add that? Where we have a skateboard park and a pool and pickleball courts and such, is there a need for both in, in each community? So, you know, as part of that plan, you're not just looking at Quispam 6, but you'll be looking at the region and the amenities that we offer. So it'll also be a tool for residents to know if they're interested in something uh, recreation from a recreation perspective, where that is, and we want to align our work with that plan. So it helps us, as you mentioned, moving forward. Thank you, yes, and certainly looking at a regional uh, sport plan is, is very helpful, and we've been talking about that for a number of years. So again, I will pass this on to next in queue, and that would be Councillor Luck. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> and no surprise, I do have a few questions. Um, so the first question I have is you had mentioned, I mean, I first, I guess, kudos, like I do, I agree with Councillor Miller, we are so lucky, we have the most amazing resources for community services, I personally think, anywhere. Thank you. Um, so you'd mentioned that, um, you know, in terms of the passes, 64% are Q or Quispem CIS residents, and even with the pool, about 57% are Quispem CIS residents. And I know that we're big on, you know, regionalized support, and we're sending money to other areas because we know our uh, residents are using St. John facilities. And I guess I'm just wondering if that could be something that we could look at in the future is that it's our taxpayers in Quispam CIS that use our facilities, but then we're also inviting other people from other communities to use it. And have we ever considered maybe a user fee um, since we aren't getting St. John to give us money to actually support some of our facilities, is there a possibility just in terms of looking at, you know, kind of offsetting some of these operational and upkeep costs? So I guess that's my first question. I, I think that would be something that would be a part of a recreation master plan. I think we would talk about it during that process. Council has not expressed an interest previously in having a non-resident resident rate over the years. It has been discussed at different points in time. But the feeling um, has not been that that's where council would like to go. And that obviously can change. The only time that I've heard from council where they would like to see a non-resident rate is the pool. When we were opening the pool at the Cuplex, our council at the time did not want to see Quispam CIS residents on the outside looking in if the pool was full. So that is the only time other than um, facility rental. So there is a slight discount for residents to rent our facilities like the beach house and for our swimming lessons. Uh, and, but you have to be a member of, in order to be a member of the Cuplex pool, you have to be a Quispam CIS resident. And that is the only place where we have that resident, non-resident rate. Um, another question I have is I know that the, um, you know, there's things kind of pending. So for example, the smoke-free bylaws is, is kind of waiting because I think the last time it was looked at, it was really COVID has kind of put a kibosh to it at the time being. But I'm assuming, fingers crossed, as we move into 2022, COVID will be a thing of the past. Is there something in the budget to accommodate for some of those potential signage changes or anything? So I think it's going to affect kind of recreation maybe more than other things. And maybe that's more in the um, kind of engineering works budget, but I'm just wondering if that was kind of considered when we were looking at the budgets for 2022. For, uh, for signage for the... I know that you had a plan, you know, yes. a proposed plan at one point, but because of COVID yes. things got shut down. So I guess whatever that plan was and whatever the, the you know, costs were to implementing that plan, has that been considered for... We have, well, and also with the council strategic plan and what has moved forward from that. But I'd have to ask the treasurer, we had a line item for smoke freeze basis bylaw, and I'm not sure if that was carried forward. I don't have anything in the current budget for that specific item, but we did something. have a, a budget when it was first brought forward a couple of years ago. We had a line item, I think, for $15,000, and I'm not sure if that was carried forward into previous budgets. 
or upcoming budget, sorry, from that budget. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Brandon. Oh, Catherine's on. <laughs> Would you like to speak about that? <laughs> Two weeks into your new job? <laughs> Um, yes, there is some carry forward money in reserve for that. So if there was any work that we would need to do, then we would come to council for that and then ask to bring some of that money out of reserve potentially either at year end or at the time that we would be doing this work. Is I, I like two more questions. One is the town hall building evaluation. Just wondering if you could give a like. I know this building isn't that old, so I, I know it's not a huge line item, but I'd like to get a bit more understanding of I guess why we need it at this point in time. Sure, the town hall is 20 years old now, and it's had several reiterations of organization. And of course, a lot has changed in 20 years with the town and the growth that we've had. So we've. Um, I would say reconfigured multiple sections of this building, whether it's the basement where there's curtains and plexiglass between offices, and we've added um, a couple of staff down there. We have a very large records room, which is underneath here. We've turned filing rooms upstairs and meeting rooms into office space. So we um, would like to engage a consultant to come in and have a look at the office design, the office layout, and make recommendations to make us more efficient in our workspace moving forward. We know that there's going to be capital work that's going to be required for the building, a new roof. We have had um, air conditioning go down a couple of times this year for this building. So we know that there's some capital work coming up that will be required for this space. But we also want to have a look at the, the layout of staff and the function, functionability. Um, we've done some internal work, as I've mentioned, but we really would like to uh, engage an architect to come in and have a look and then meet with the staff and talk about how we function as a group and our, where staff are located and can we be more efficient in where we, where we work and how the building's designed. Thank you. And my last one, I, as, similar to Council Miller, this is I'm probably the, uh, it's maybe not as much of a question as a comment because he has already um, asked it. It's about the recreation master plan. Um, and I guess seeing all these, um, like I mean, again, all the amazing services that we have and also the cost of upkeeping all these things that we currently have. And also, you know, I mean, the example of, you know, because you guys are on, you know, you have your finger on the pulse and you, you know, are watching kind of how the community interacts and uses some of these resources already, it gives you a lot of data in terms of, okay, we need extra pickleball courts or we need something. You know, I don't necessarily think that's piecemeal because we have so many offerings already. Um, so again, I'm happy to hear that the plan isn't potentially to expand that because again, I think we need to look at what we have and how we can kind of maximize the use there. Personally, I think, you know, I know it's not a lot of money, but all these numbers add up. And I think in terms of priorities and looking at other things we need to potentially fund, I would like to see us perhaps wait until we have a strategic plan based on what council feels, you know, and the town feels like our moving forward plan before we decide, like I kind of sometimes feel like we're put, that would be putting the cart before the horse in terms of knowing what our priorities are, you know, knowing what resources we have. And, and then if, you know, if that's something that's highlighted in the strategic plan that we need, then do it versus doing it now. But, um, you know, just because it is, you know, again, doesn't seem like a lot, but it all adds up. Um, so it's one more cost, you know, amongst quite a few other very important things that, you know, I kind of feel need to happen um, in next year's budget. So anyway, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Luck. Next in queue is Councillor Donovan. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have a, a, qu a quick question about the stairs. Um, I, I think I already know, but I'm just, I want clarification. So in in the, the presentation, you just had a picture of the one set of stairs. It's for both, isn't it? Yes. The $70,000. And... Um, is there going to be anything like traction wise or like um, like a coating on the steel stairs? Because I don't know if you've ever tried to go down a steel slide in the summertime, but it's really hot. So I'm like worried that it might be too hot on people's feet. Do you know what I mean? We would. There'd be something on the okay. stairs. 
Perfect. I've not gone down a steel slide, but I've gone down a hot plastic slide. <laughs> I thought that was a mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Next in queue is Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thanks for an excellent presentation. Um, like has been said already here, I mean, we have this amazing array of recreational services and uh, facilities and everything in our town, and, and everybody's proud as punch, clearly, about it. But what strikes me <clears throat> listening to your presentation is um, that it's not enough just to have these things, but we have to be able to curate them properly, and you're doing an excellent job of that, clearly. So really, really good uh, forecasts on what to address, and I'm really impressed. I wouldn't have the slightest clue what to start with, so that's <laughs> really well done. I also just have a quick question about the recreational master plan. And I just, it's just a simple question. I just wonder if that strategy also uh, would, you know, imagine forecasts of like revenue growth as well by virtue of our facilities. So for example, Councilor Miller mentions, oh, should we maybe consider user fees for pickleball courts? And you've said that there is some thought around that. And, and council, of course, has bounced around uh, resident, non-resident fees for things, et cetera, et cetera. But I wonder if a a comprehensive master plan for recreation and community services would necessarily, like if it would be built into that, some forecast of increases of revenue growth. Um, so that was my question. Well, thank you, that's a good question. And I think that we can incorporate that into the process and we can put that in the request for proposals and uh, whether it's forecasting or perhaps it'll, I would think it'll be more around making recommendations for resident, non-resident rate or is it, you're low on this item, maybe you could increase on this, you could start charging for pickleball courts if there's a club that wants preferred times, which we think there is, um, and sponsorships is another area. I, I certainly think that, that would be, it would be very robust and we could look, because there hasn't been one since 1987, and obviously a lot's changed since then, that um, we, could, we could draft a request for proposals that would incorporate that. Thank you, Councillor Bigger. Next in the queue is Deputy Mayor Schreier. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Dana, great um, presentation. Thank you very much. We've got a lot in the, our community that even the tour the other day let us know um, things that we have that you don't always see. Um, I'll speak first to the rec Master Recreational Plan. I personally think it's a, a wonderful idea. And because I, I really truly believe that we need to make our recreational and leisure facilities or and amenities um, intergenerational. And there could be areas that we're missing uh, just because of the, the not as vocal, uh, perhaps, you know, it's a smaller group it, for different reasons. And I mean, recreation and leisure is, is different today than it was when we were a younger community. We have um, our senior population that is very active and looking for, you know, perhaps a place to play game of cards and, you know, as well as do a hike on a trail. So um, the active living has changed dramatically. And um, I don't want to see us just um, funnel it into just recreational facilities. It's much, much more than that. And I, I believe that a master plan, if we understand what the residents are asking for and then apply it to our strategic plan, I think that would be a logical sequence to me. Um, so that's on the master plan. And the I wanted to sort of go back to the rates and um, I know that we have an increase in rates of uh, user rates at about 3%. Mm -hmm. So could you clarify for me again, you said last year our user rates were drastically reduced due to COVID. Our so rates weren't reduced. Our budget or our, revenue. Our, the was actual it? revenue yes, was yes. reduced. So, so, this so that's why you see the 21% this year. And so it's it was not. because we took it down twenty five percent last year overall revenue. We didn't not we did not decrease rates. Okay, so I have two questions on the rates, and one is for you, and one would be for Krista, our um, treasurer. Is um, I I'm really concerned about accessibility for all, that all residents have the opportunity to use our 
rights, to use our ball fields, to use whatever it is, and not be not being able to access because of affordability. And um, because it's important that residents feel that they can go out and use it. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what we do provide to residents um, that affordability may be uh, a barrier for them to get to sure. our, our Well, thank facilities. you for that, because we don't often talk about that. And that's one of, been one of our pillars in Quispam CIS for many years. With the start of the Arts and Culture Park, Council at that time decided everything that is being offered in that park is going to be free of charge so that everyone can go. So we've had movies in the park and music in the park and movement in the park, as you know. We've had families there that would not be able to afford to go to the movies together. But they can come to the movies here on a Friday night and it's free and they get popcorn and the kids come in their pajamas and their sleeping bag and they have a great time. And we also knew that from that experience as well as um, public skating. If we remember, uh, you may have been in a council at the time, but we used to charge for public skating. We charged $2 a person or $5 a family. When we dropped the fees for that, our rates quadrupled. So we knew, even though that was really small, we knew that that amount of money impacted the people that came to public skating. So with that information, we built the Qplex and we were doing our capital fundraising campaign. And at the time, that was a $24 million building. The council knew that if we want to be successful, we want to make sure that everybody has access to that building. And therefore, since we've opened, we've had free public skating and we've had free swimming at the pool, one hour every day. And, we, and, and then there's times where we've discussed it throughout the budget process internally with staff. It's a challenge. That, that one hour free swimming is really popular. And, um, and it's challenging to, um, to lifeguard. But we've had that commitment over the years, and it's also a pillar of our national strategy for, it's called the National Framework for Recreation, which Council endorsed a couple of years ago, and I was fortunate to be a part of creating. And accessibility is one of the pillars of that recreation master plan, or sorry, recreation document, which I hope to use as a foundation for our recreation master plan. And sometimes we're thought of as a community of affluence and we have a food bank, and I'm not sure what the current numbers, but it used to be 150 families, I believe it's more now, that use that food bank. So we have pockets of poverty here, as you know. They're just hidden. People need access to our facilities for their physical health, their mental health, and I think we do a great job in role modeling that for other communities. They have done similar things that we have with reducing their fees or eliminating the fees for public skating. And uh, I think I'm very proud of that, that we do that. I'm proud of the council making the decision to continue to do that for our community because we do have people that can't afford to pay. And um, we provide them with that opportunity, not only in our outdoor facilities, like, like our trails and, and such, but our indoor ones that cost us a lot of money are able to be accessed by everyone. Yeah, th thank you for that, because it, it's important to me that uh, we make sure that we continue to do that, and even where we can add. I know we've just recently uh, allowed for KB3 to um, use some of our space, and um, but it's just so important that to be inclusive as a community that everyone has access and um, you know it's equal equal yes, equal access. 100%. Um, so I'm glad to hear that that's still budgeted for going forward and if opportunities arise for somewhere else. Um, and I don't know what those opportunities are, but I believe a master plan will explore those opportunities as well because we have to remember that, the, you know, we, we want to be totally inclusive. And, you know, there's um, maybe an, un, um, an unspoken population that hasn't voiced really as much as that they, they would like to see in our community. So I think that's really important. So thank you for that. Um, th my next question would be to Krista on the rates. If we held the rates on our user rates, what would that do to our budget?
Um, I would just probably just have to pull that number. It's not, it's, it, it is because, because we go through actually, and um, through, through this, we have our revenue calculated based on our use it, usage and whatnot. And then we kind of take the rates and on each line item within the budget that there's a revenue, we add that 3% kind of revenue growth. Um, it It's not highly material. Um, you know, we have about $1.15 million in community services revenue, which we have the 3% already built into that. So I could probably do some quick calculations just to pull that out. Um, but it's not a, a fairly significant amount. And we do still run our facilities at a deficit, especially the QPlex at over a million dollars almost, and the QMA at a couple hundred thousand as well. So really by increasing these user fees, we're trying to kind of lessen the overall impact to all taxpayers and have the users actually using the facility paying for that. So I can do some quick calculations and I'll get back to you with that. Thank you, Councillor Schreier. Uh, next in queue, we have Councillor Olson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for a very uh, detailed uh, uh, wish list. <laughs> I know. But I think, uh, and, I, and I say that with tongue in cheek <clears throat> because it identifies a lot of uh, maintenance uh, maintenance items too that uh, need to be uh, addressed on an annual budget, uh, if on an annual basis in our budgets. If you take a look at uh, QMA, which is the, what, 39 years old now, opened in 83, it, it looks like a brand new rink. I mean, it's beautiful. And, uh, and that's because we've made investments over the years and we haven't ignored it. So that's been a positive step. I'd just like to address a couple of things. Um, the recreation master plan, I'll get with that theme, um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to ask if we have ever if we have ever evaluated putting a cover on the pool. And I think of that's I've seen presentations at uh, FCM, okay, at uh, trade yes. shows, where they uh, where they install like uh, garage doors that come down similar to what they have at uh, Barrel's Head. Mm -hmm. You know, if you notice that, I mean, yes. you bring them down and, and that, that is what it basically is. It's a, it's a combination solid wall with retractable, uh, re with retractable walls that give you that full exposure when you can. Um, I think that if, if we're gonna do that recreation master plan, I'd like to see that a little bit of time and effort put into evaluating that because I, I still get requests from uh, uh, residents, uh, you know, about that. So I'll leave that one with you. Um, the, uh, the trails, I, th I think there's, there's been a lot of good work done on the trails. And uh, uh, one of my passions, I think, is to uh, pave more pit trails, to make it more accessible for the uh, uh, for the uh, uh, residents that uh, have a struggle with a normal uh, gravel trail, whether it's in a walker, using a walker or wheelchair or whatever. But uh, I think it, uh, the trail that we uh, paved down by Ritchie Lake, I think it's been a godsend for those people. And I think you mentioned the numbers of people that are using that. Yes, and um, I know it hit a peak of 9,000 in one month during COVID. And I think this is the last count was over 5,000 a month. And uh, they're well used and, and we were fortunate to, to access an accessibility grant um, from the federal government for $98,000 to pay for the majority of that paving. But the whole point behind that, as you've mentioned, is accessibility for not only people that are able, but for the, those that are not. And that is the only piece of trail that to someone that's not able-bodied, has mobility issues, can use um, kids with in a stroller, you know, with their moms or whatever. It's it's a our busiest piece of trail 
in the community. And I think to your point, the recreation master plan would help us identify and again, engaging with the community where that next piece would be because there are a lot of passionate people um, that use our trails and there are some that are adamant that they do not want certain sections paved. And we know that. We know that it wouldn't make sense to pave you know, certain a section of trail around, perhaps around the Qplex, but maybe there's another section. We know that there's an interest in more dog friendly areas, a dog uh, trail that's dog friendly. Uh, we know that there's an interest in another kayak lay down area, which we've been monitoring um, with development opportunities to see if we can secure from land for public purpose on the Hammond River for another kayak lay down area because it's so busy at the Hammond R River Angling Association. So I think to your point, there's those things and the roof to the uh, the, the pool, they, they can be all be flushed out as part of a overall recreation master plan to hear some of the voices of the people, as you mentioned, that maybe we haven't heard from and to see what their needs are and where we can look at different amenities and, and the usage of those amenities. What I think would be, uh, what I think would be uh, a positive uh, source of, uh, of uh, information would be to evaluate the uh, development of a trail going from A to Z. I mean, we, we're doing little short pieces, but what could we visualize in a phased in period over amount of time so that they could go quite a distance, you know, within our community and approaching the uh, the major trail that will be connecting with Rossay at some point in time. Well, that, that is, you know, to your point, exactly. That's the envision that ha always has been the vision for the QR trail. That's why it's called the QR trails, Chris Pimps' Rossay Trail. And, and Rossay has committed over the years to um, finish the trail at their end. So I know that they've come into some land issues there and they're working on that, but I couldn't agree more. That's the goal is to have an active transportation trail linear through our community that has spurs off into popular nodes in the community, whether it's schools, business district. Um, in the meantime, we have opportunities through development for land for public purpose, which is how um, these trail uh, pieces that we're developing now. They're short trails, but they're really well used. They're connecting. And if you look at some of the places where we put our trails, these connector pieces, there's already, the community's already doing it. There are already well-worn trails uh, that our residents have created. We're formalizing it. We're putting, you know, making it wider. We're making it safer. We're putting the crusher dust down. We're signing it so it's more formal so you don't feel like you're trespassing when you make these shortcuts. But they're equally as important as a trail that somebody would use for exercising or fitness. Um, those are, as I mentioned, for walkability, safety, accessible, and to make the healthy choice the easy choice. So I think there's a, mix, there's a need for both. And uh, that's what we work on as a staff with our active transportation committee, which has the planning officer on it and uh, engineering team and then our parks facilities staff and myself so we're we've been meeting every month every month for 10 years and we look at uh, you know if development comes up we look at um, land for public purpose and can we make a trail connection we've made a couple of really important ones with our schools we've partnered with uh, Quispamsis Middle School and Quispamsis Elementary School with trail connectors so the kids don't have to go all the way around or the parents don't have to wait drive drive all the way around and then clog up our streets with the parking that they'll get on their bikes and or they'll walk and take these trails to school. So I think there's a need for both of those uh, and I couldn't agree more and I hope that sometime soon we'll see Rossay's piece of the QR trail developed so we can have that linear trail and we'll continue to look up at the other end of the QR trail from our perspective. No, that, that's good. I think it's an opportunity to develop that and uh, uh, evaluate it. Uh, going back to the uh, to the uh, stairs at the pool. Mm -hmm. How come we're only doing one set? We're, that's both. That is both sets? Yes. Okay, well that's a little bit more explainable, I think, because galvanized steel, I think that it'll last forever. Yes. You know, and I, I think doing the both sets, I think, is a wise move, so yes. that uh, clarifies the numbers a little better. I just wanted to confirm that it was two sets. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, because they're almost the same type of, uh, of stairs, exactly. you know, both sides, both ends of the thing. Um, the, um, I wonder if you have any vision for, uh, for creating more efficiency with the boat ramp. I know that I've uh, visited that daily almost, no. and I've seen 50 trailers. 
parked everywhere that they could drop yes. a trailer, whether it's on our new grass or whether it's blocking all of the parking in front of our uh, beach house. But people are very uh, demanding of the town with really no input into the thing. I mean, financial input into the thing for operations. And I know we've expanded our parking. We've done some things, but we're still struggling, I think. In that we're, as you know, um, we're maxed out with our parking down there. We've added a few more spots with the renovations of the beach house, and we just don't have the land without removing one of our amenities to add more parking. I think that if, again, this is something we could look at with the Recreation Master Plan, and if that doesn't occur this year, we can do a survey. We can have a community consultation process like we did with Hammond River Park or Trails or what have you. So I, see, I, I, I think we'd have to look into that either on its own or as part of a recreation master plan. But we just don't have land down there to add more parking, so we'd have to come up with something else to, uh, to help solve that situation. Because you're right, it's, it's uh, at a premium parking and then we have all the other amenities, the playground, the beach, the Mies Cove Beach House, ball fields, volleyball courts, trail, all in that one spot, which is great, but it all, parking is Yeah, I think issue. I think it's the uh, it's the boaters that I, I think kind of abuse the uh, parking. You know, they show up and just dump their trailers wherever they can see a piece of yeah. property that they can leave it and some of them are double parked and some of them are illegal. And they take up a lot of space with their trailer. And well, the sure, and you know, but uh, anyway, Good I, point. Think, I, I think it's a, it's a challenge. Um, the, uh, is there any suggestions for uh, use using the land that we purchased on the Hampton Road, you know, down, across down past Daly's? Yeah, well... What? Sleepy yeah. Hollow Lane across from big, there. Yeah, yeah. And use, is there any suggestions for that? For yeah. Um, well, I, I, and I don't mean to beat this drum, but the recreation master plan would be a, that would be something that we would look at in the recreation master plan. Um, as you know, we have done a facility stu study with regards to fields, and there was a recommendation for fields at the, in that location, which was um, turned down at the time by council. That being said, um, we haven't heard from those groups since that their needs are not being met. So um, we've got that piece of property that we can look to for the future. But again, I would want that to be a part of a study on its own or a part of a recreation master plan to, again, <coughs> look at the data, look at the registration numbers, COVID aside, see what the trends are moving forward, and then determine what the best use would be for that land. And of course, from there, look at our budget and see how that would fit in. My own impression of the use of the ball fields, even we got beautiful ball fields with lights on them and everything else, and they seem to be empty quite a bit. Are they just looking for prime time usage and really haven't been saturated to the point that they're overlapping into less used hours or what's well, your I impression think, there? I think you're right. It's similar to the arenas where you have people want to play from five until nine, Monday through yeah. Friday, and the ball fields on the weekends are a challenge, but our usage is better than it was. And groups are, I think, have heard that message from council previously when they presented during the um, during that field analysis. And they've heard the comments from councillors in the past about the empty fields on mm -hmm. some of the evenings on the weekends. And they have stepped up and they use weekend field time and. Um, they, they, they would buck our fields. Um, are they maxed out? I don't think so. Uh, I certainly think that there would uh, need to be more um, more feedback from the users for us to have a look at a field study um, and, and a recommendation coming forward to council for fields. I think the lighting of that field certainly and our work with the groups to align the bookings has been helpful. We've also moved to a booking system where they book by per time slot, not for the season like they used to. So our goal is, and we just started that this year, so our goal is to work with them to create more efficiency in using the fields because our staff do a lot of work um, in the prep of those fields for each individual time and for us to do that work and then not have a user group show up. It, it, it makes them more accountable when we charge by the hour like we do ICE. So we've just recently adopted that um, practice with our groups this year. So we are making an effort to 
to make the groups a little more accountable. Because if you book it for the season, it's easier to perhaps cancel than it is if you know you have to pay for that time. Now our rates are quite low, um, but uh, we do we do recognize that 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 it, creating that usage is important, and uh, we'd be looking to a recreation master plan again down the road for that for that space and to determine the need because it may may not be a ball field or a soccer field anymore. It might be something else. So. Um. I'd just like to say that uh, I think that you and your staff have done a super job. Well, I think that we can hold our community up against anybody in New Brunswick. And I'm very proud of everything that we have and with your vision in that. Uh, and uh, sometimes a little bit of uh, arm twisting uh, by council, uh, uh, pushing back. But uh, I, I think it's great. A lot, a lot of positive things, a lot of original ideas that are going out there. and. Uh, uh, I've always said that we have to try and address the interests and the uh, requests of all ages. Yes. You know, and uh, whether it's the youngest kids on little bikes and the bigger kids on bigger bikes, you know, I think it's great. So thank you very much for I everybody. appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Olson. I'm going to go to the treasurer, Ms. Brandon. Hi, Your Worship. So through you uh, to Deputy Mayor Schreier. So... The impact of revenue on the rate increase would be $15,225 on a budget of $1.15 million. $15,225 is what 3% equates to. Thank you, Ms. Brandon. I'll go to next in queue, uh, Councillor Luck. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a comment and one other question. So my question, then I'll, then I'll ask, say the comment, and then you can ask. Somewhere I thought I sit, saw that the, well, first of all, I'm sold. Thank you, councillors. <laughs> it was a really good discussion. I'm sold on the master transfer, master recreation plan. <laughs> I do see the value in doing it now. <laughs> um, for some reason, I thought I read somewhere that it was 100 thousand allocated so I had just, I know you mentioned 60 so I just maybe wanted to get that confirmed and and just you know listening to um Councillor or Deputy Mayor Schreier and Councillor Olson you know both of them have kind of identified you know the importance of you know kind of hearing from all ages and the voices of the people that perhaps we don't always hear from and that would be something that I guess would be one of my requests is and something that I am a little bit concerned about is sometimes when we do rely too much on social media, we don't get to the people that we really want to get to. So if we are doing an RFP or, or, you know, as part of, you know, when we're searching out the, you know, whoever's going to do this master transportation plan, I'd really like to make sure that the methods that we're using ensure that we do hear from some of those smaller user groups that may not either be on social media or just may not be as vocal or, you know, as, um, willing to kind of jump in if they see something or maybe they just don't even see it. So I just want to make sure that when we are building this plan, it is truly representative of our residents because I think sometimes we rely a bit too much on social media. So we're getting, again, the people that are quite active on it, mm -hmm. but there's lots of other people in our community to Deputy Mayor Schreier's point. Potentially, if we're looking at maybe an older demographic, are we truly getting a true sense of what their needs are? So that would be... Uh, That's a good point. And in the past, we have... Uh, developed plans, the active transportation plan, for example, uh, our QPlex when we were building that, we did a lot more extensive um, in interviews. We've done one on one interviews. We have had our consultants go into the school and meet with uh, different classrooms. And we are using the surveys with social media for smaller projects like Hamden River Park, for example, the trails uh, survey or playground things like that, where there's much smaller pieces, we do, we will do the social media piece. We're doing that ourselves internally. But when we have a larger project, like the active transportation plan and the uh, QPlex, we, I know being on the building committee and at that time, and, the, and uh, the communications committee, we interviewed, we had 53 different interviews set up with individuals, with groups. We interviewed groups that weren't using the QPlex, like or, sorry, um, our existing facilities, like speed skating. We interviewed walkers, we interviewed runners, we interviewed dog owners, seniors, youth. So definitely to your point, we would, we would use multiple avenues for reaching out to our community members. It wouldn't be 
just a simple survey. The field study, again, was a $15,000 survey, very small, um, that was done several years ago to specific to fields. But something larger, that was a more significant investment, we're able to uh, hire a cons consultant who would have the time and the resources to go in and meet with different groups and then also do some individual face-to-face -face so we could specifically target youth, seniors, and persons with a disability. They were extensively consulted during the QPlex um, building process. So yeah, to your point, most definitely we'll be using more than social media. Thank you, Councillor Luck. We're going to next in queue, and that would be Councillor Donovan. Thank you, Your Worship. I um, just have a few comments, not really questions for you, um, but I agree with everybody else in the sense that the uh, plan will make you know accessibility, especially to the trails, um, it'll it'll help outline it a little bit better. So I'll give you a quick example. So a while back, I had actually um, submitted for an agenda um, as far as putting a bench on the QR trail, and it was this. I discussed with the mayor, and she said that it was going to be done, and and it did get done actually um and but the problem is is sometimes i think we overlook things when it comes to accessibility you know accessibility in those trails doesn't have to be as difficult as people make it seem you know the reason i asked for that bench was because you know i every time i walk i see older residents and they get halfway through those trails and it's i mean as a bigger person it's hard for me you know walking around and you get tired halfway through the trails but i can't imagine being you know 82 years old like this this woman was that i was talking to and she was sitting on a rock in the middle of the trail because there was no bench and you know we did uh, um, eventually get a bench there but the bench was at the beginning of the trail in a parking like right at the parking lot so from a logical standpoint if i wanted like you know if you're going to have a bench at the beginning of the parking lot at the beginning of the trail why wouldn't I walk the extra two feet and go sit in my car? Do you know what I mean? Like, does that does that make yeah. sense? So uh, the reasoning we had it there was because in our the optics at our end was it was halfway. So a lot of people will park at uh, the Ecole de Pigné and use our trail from that end. So yeah, yeah. I mean, well, and it it just depends on where you access the trail. So for some people, it's at the start, and others, it's halfway through, so a lot of people that use our trail, I mean, the parking lot's busy, so we know people travel there, but it's also a key trail and an active transportation network, so a lot of people are coming from the subdivisions around there, so we thought that it was halfway through. But uh, we'll add to your comment, we have been reached, uh, contacted this week by Trans Canada Trails, and, and our Parks and Facilities Manager can help me clarify this, but um, if it needs further clarification, they're doing um, accessibility studies on trails and they've reached out to us. And we're just trying to find a member of our community right now to help us go out and do an analysis of accessibility from a trail perspective. And we have done that in the past um, with a couple of residents, in particular a gentleman who has a wife in a wheelchair. And this is before the QR trail was paved. And we walked uh, through with him. Our Parks and Facilities Manager went through the trail network with him and he gave us tips and hints of how we can improve certain sections so at least they would have a loop. So to your point, yes, we, we are working on that and we, we know that there's certain sections that we can do better and we're hoping that with this uh, initiative with TransCanada Trails as part of their audit that we'll make some more improvements to that. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. And in the interest of time, if we could keep uh, questions to the budget in front of you and to the discussion through the uh, Director of Community Services, uh, I'm going to go now to next in queue. Uh, Councillor Miller, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and I'm okay with master plan, so just so you know, and thank you for the clarification on the stairs. Um, I just, so, and sorry, Your Worship, it was just a comment. Um, I, I know Deputy Mayor had talked about the um, the increase, and just for perspective, though, um, we are still the cheapest. Uh, like, if you look at the Qplex pool rates, we're still cheaper per day than the Rossé. We've added a few changes, and that 3% that we've added, plus changing to day rates and now charging a premium for the uh, for profit of $29 per hour, which is brilliant, thank you. Um, that's $6,000 added to the Qplex revenue. And if you just went through that budget, we're spending $500,000 on repairs just in the Qplex and upgrades. So people don't like increases, but try to compare. So we're now charging $129 or 20, whatever, 26 for the Qplex during the day is still 150 some dollars at Rossi during the day. So we, we are well within our means and we 
do all the free stuff. So, um, you know, Cuplex, you also got to consider operating deficit about 700 grand. Our principal and interest on our loans and that is 1.1 million. Um, we're, we're doing pretty good. So um, thank you for that. And, and we do, as you stated, 60% are Quispam Sys residents and 40% are also. And we do need to have a little bit of user pay on some of these things uh, because there are residents that don't use any of these events. So um, you know, I just want to say thank you. Sorry, Your Worship. It's supposed to be a question. I did a comment. As, as chair, and certainly with the uh, discussion on the budget lines, that's uh, certainly well taken and well appreciated. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Deputy Mayor Schreier. Uh, yes, thank you, and um, thank you, Councillor Miller, for those comments on the user fee. I just wanted to make sure that uh, we're not going to, 3% is not too high considering what people have been going through with COVID and restrictions on um, trying to keep everything as low as possible. Uh, and understanding that the Qplex does run in a deficit but it also gives benefits, health benefits, that is very um, almost impossible for us to measure. Uh, just one last question, I'm sorry. Um, on our tour, you mentioned about a splash pad, and I noticed it's not in the budget. So is that something that you would refer to the master recreational plan, or what are your thoughts on that? I would, ref that would, I think, we've had a splash pad come up uh, in us, well, from, I've had emails from residents uh, not multiple residents, a couple of residents about a splash pad. Um, we've had it in the budget before where it's, and it's been eliminated and we have applied most recently this summer for a grant from the federal government for a splash pad. And I'm waiting to hear back from that right now. It's a grant, it was a new grant opportunity, 75% uh, funding. Uh, we would fund our portion from the capital reserves if we were successful in that. So. Um, we, it's on our radar. We've heard it from the Hammond River Park survey. There was a couple of people that mentioned a splash pad out there. We know that's not the ideal location for that. We feel that the ideal location would be in this area with the downtown. And, and again, we know that there's a hub at Means Cove and at the Qplex. We feel that this would be a great location where the, it's close to the daycares and the schools and it could be close to the business district and it's walkable. Um, we believe there's a lot of benefits to a splash pad. And it, um, we're going to continue to chase grant opportunities to make that happen, but I certainly, uh, it was something I would hourly discuss perhaps, let the community, I, I think that's part of the process with the Recreation Master Plan, so we want to guide that, we want them to tell us um, their thoughts about our current situation with recreation, are they pleased with our amenities, are there areas to improve, and again, it's not always about building new, it's about accessing um, opportunities for accessibility. It's about the land perhaps out on Sleepy Hollow, which most people probably don't know about. That might be something that we identify for consideration, but um, but it's. Uh, it, I think it would be a robust discussion and I wouldn't doubt at all that a splash pad would come into that. So that's why we're being proactive and applying for that grant opportunity. So um, I'm hoping we'll hear something very soon about that. And we'll of course bring that back to council when that happens. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Schreier. And I don't see any other questions at this time for the Director of Community Services. However, I will say that uh, we, were, we are going to have a 10 minute health break. So we'll be back here. We'll resume at about uh, 10.46. Thank you. Thank you.